Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Today, we're really excited. We have Dr. Ski Chilton with us. We're going to call him Dr. Ski. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on what we're going to be talking about today. He has a new Amazon uh, number one bestseller out called There is Another Way to Happiness. It's largely about this four-step CAST process, C-A-S-T. That's an acronym, and we'll be talking about that as well. And um, Dr. Ski presents it with a rare blend of science, mindfulness, and spirituality to walk readers through the four overlapping steps that helped him overcome his own cycle of fear, anxiety, self-doubt that led him to a total transformation. Dr. Ski is a distinguished innovator, academic, and entrepreneur with a prolific record of over 160 publications and 15 patents. He founded the four companies and a nonprofit. Is that correct, Dr. Ski? Yeah. Yeah. And he has been at the forefront of his personalized nutrition and wellness, earning widespread widespread recognition in both academia and um, other industries for his trailblazing contributions. So Dr. Ski, just give us a little more background about your book and about, you know, kind of like a summary of your life story and what brought you here today. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. My life has has been a life of of polar almost opposites. I I grew up in a house without a bathroom in the Appalachian Mountains, so um, I was severely dyslexic, and being severely dyslexic couldn't read coming out of high school. So it was an inauspicious start, to say the least. Um, that time in Appalachia, and especially being Appalachia in dyslexia, uh, you got separated and you got put into special trailers. And, and uh, I tell people that those special trailers uh, that were given ugly names um, really put in me a deep fear a deep fear, a deep constant refrain that I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I'm not worthy and I'm I'm not enough. Well, my life it, early, at least through the mid 40s, was damn it, I'll 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 show you I'm enough. And that created a very, very successful career by the world standards. Uh uh, it was a career in which, uh, you know, I got a six-year PhD in biochemistry in three years. I trained with a Nobel Prize winner. I was a professor at Johns Hopkins and then professor at Wake Forest and 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 five years ago recruited to the University of Arizona. Again, all the companies, the six books, the publications, it created a highly successful person, but it also created a person with a deep, intense fear of failure and a deep fear that he wasn't enough. And in my mid forties uh, to 50, really came through coming out of a second marriage, seemed to be saving the world in Africa and other places and hurting the people I love the most or they were hurting me. So, so I went back to, to, to school, a, a school of philosophy at Wake Forest and studied the issue of free will just to determine if I had any. At that point in time, I wrote a book called The Rewired Brain, and it's how we screw up our lives with our unconscious minds and the predominance of our unconscious minds and how they drive unhappiness. At that point, a woman came up to me at a book signing at a Barnes and Noble, and she said, I hate you. And I said, wow. I said, that was pretty strong. And she, I, I said, why do you hate me? And she said, you told me in no uncertain terms why my life was messed up, but you didn't provide a solution. And she said, that was the equivalent of saying, I had a tumor, but I can't remove your tumor. So, so the next six years were a meditation journey. 
Uh, no one could have poo-pooed meditation any more than me eight years ago. Uh, but this journey, now there are 10,000 scientific articles on meditation, over 250 clinical trials, and this dramatically changed my life. It dramatically turned my life upside down. Wow. I, I That's like the first thing that just came to my mind. That's really an incredible backstory. Um, can I, since we talked about meditation briefly, um, what type of meditation did you study? Well, it, it, so being a scientist, I just jumped in uh, to Insight Timer. There's 80,000 meditations on there. Probably, you know, less than 5% resonated with me uh, because they're all over the place. And, yeah. and they're, they're, you know, they're for religious people. They're for hippy dippy people. They're this, they're that, they're this. But as a evolutionary biochemist and geneticist, I was looking for a framework that made sense. What was this all about? Why has it been around for 10,000 years and over the 6,000 years well documented? What are the essential elements and frameworks that can change people? And how can that come together with our, our, our modern ideas of the human brain and our modern ideas of human evolution. So uh, it was a weird mixture of science and mindfulness and trying to go back. I, I studied Buddhism for a couple of years, trying to go back to where do those Venn diagrams overlap to produce a framework that is understandable for people. Okay, so uh, because I studied transcendental meditation years ago, and I noticed that there were so many different types of meditation out there, and I just wondered if you settled upon any of like the well-known ones, or did you just create your own style? And I created my own, and, and the the cast process is the framework. Uh, the one thing I'm pretty good at is uh, is being creative, and I think people with dyslexia are creative, and so. Mm -hmm. The five companies that you mentioned, the the thirty patents that I have, and the trademarks. Uh, if there's anything that I do well, it is creativity, and taking complex ideas and putting them in a framework that people understand. And so that was the process. The process you utilized elements of all types of meditations. But again, it was put into a framework that made sense in the context of what we understand about the human brain, emotions, and spirituality. Wonderful, wonderful. So your book, There is Another Way to Happiness, um, the title alone kind of piqued my curiosity because I've noticed that happiness, if you you know, we can use that word, seems to be something that folks are just not anymore. Like even my closest friends are struggling with that concept. And I I wanted to to speak to you because I really wanted to get to the to the core of is there such a thing as happiness and is it achievable? And and and, and of course we'll we'll get into a lot of that, but um let's talk about your book. So um, let's just give us an overview of of the principles of of your book and basically what folks can expect when they read it. Sure. So to your point before, there's a major misconception that happiness is natural. And there could not be anything further from the truth. And two thirds of Americans say that they're miserable. Uh, so. And the reason is, in the context of the book, is you have this dominant unconscious mind and you don't know what it's saying. You don't know. You can only feel. You can feel its feelings. You can feel the anxieties. And those translate into conscious thoughts. But that lizard brain, that squirrel brain, is dominating our lives. So this brain had only one objective. That was to get our genes into the next 
generation, our precious DNA. And you're going to only live at most 25 years old, if 150,000 years ago. So it's very fast. It remembers the past. It remembers all childhood trauma because it doesn't want to repeat them. And if it repeats them, then it won't get the genes into the next generation. It is absolutely focused on the future and controlling the future. It's don't get kicked out of the tribe. You get kicked out of the tribe and you, you're dead. So loneliness is a really, really... So every sad and difficult emotion that we humans have can almost be tra traced back to this evolutionarily bit primitive unconscious mind. For me, mine was unworthiness or I'm not enough. Well, if you're not enough and 150,000 years ago, you're not enough, then then you die. So damn it, I'm proving I'm enough. I'll I'll show you. I'll my 55 page curriculum vita will convince you that I'm worthy. But again, it, there was no chance for that to happen. So add on to that what social media does to us, add on to that what every television, the threats, the inherent threats that we're seeing as if they're happening in our own backyard. Of course, we're unhappy, Carol Ann. Of course, we're unhappy. That makes so much sense. Um... Do you think that our lizard brain has evolved any at all to like help us and prevent us from such destructive, thoughtful patterns that we experience every day? No, I, and that's where our conscious minds, our prefrontal cortex, our, it's much, much, it's evolutionarily developed only 80,000 years ago, right? as opposed to millions and millions the lizard brain's 100 million years old. Mm -hmm. So our conscious minds, they're much, much slower. They take much, much more energy. And that's why the unconscious dominates. But mindfulness, mindfulness is the ability to stop and recognize and, and look at those unconscious feelings, validate them, verify them. What am I thinking today? Wow, why am I thinking that? And why do I think that all the time? And why do I think that all the time? And do I have to think that? Can I make that go away? Can I mindfully, it's like a, a big freight train coming down the track, that unconscious feeling, anxiety, it's coming down the track, the door opens. And I have the ability to mindfully say, not today, and wait for that to go away. And so your unconscious mind has not evolved, as evidenced by all the hatred that we're seeing in our country right now. It mm -hmm. is not evolved. And we're as tribal as we ever were. And tribalism may be right at the edge of destroying us right now without these conscious minds that can look and interact and overturn rewire our unconscious minds then we can't be happy and and the reason there is another way to happiness is everybody thinks it's accomplishing so much if that would have worked don't you think a 55-page curriculum vita would have said, Ski, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're, you're, you're enough. But the thing that happens is with each achievement, there's a bigger mountain out there and a bigger mountain. We are never enough from the perspective of our childhood trauma. So mindfulness is the point that we're sitting there and we're watching those thoughts and we're understanding and we're watching those monkey minds. And it it's 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 difficult to uh, people every day. People come up to me and go, I can't meditate, I can't meditate. It took me three months every single day and a horse accident that broke my pelvis completely in half mm. and told I would never walk again 
I would never have a quality of life. I would never have any of the things I love so much. Again, it took six months in a wheelchair under a, a palm tree to develop this process. So we already talked about like your driving force behind the book. Um, can you go over what the CAST process is, is? So it stands for consciousness, awareness, surrender, and trust, correct? Yes. So what does that have to do with happiness? Maybe you can correlate for folks so we can understand because it took me a little bit until I finished your book to really kind of like cohesively put it together, but okay. I'm going to let you take over and kind of explain that. Sure. Well, the first step is awakening to consciousness. So we've talked a lot about the unconscious mind, but there's two yous in you. And they're constantly competing for your attention. Now, the the me is the un, I call the me the unconscious mind. That's that's getting that's the big mouth. That's the one that's getting all the attention. It's roaring and roaring. That's the monkey mind. The I is the true self. It's the conscious mind, but it's also the conscious mind that can connect with the creativity of the universe. It, it has incredible ability to co-create so for our Urquhart Tolle who was the great spiritual teacher that awareness in, itself that there's two me's in me was enough to enlighten him I mean it wasn't enough to enlighten me it, it was going to take many years so the first step is understanding the I and the me in me that's conscious and learning how to live with the me creating a category five hurricane and the I sitting in the middle of that hurricane, the quietness of the middle of that hurricane. And that's what we're doing. That's what we have to do. The A is deepening awareness. Now, if I didn't understand the source of I'm not enough, if I hadn't really begin to dug, dig into that, and quite often our parents, again, I'm not parent bashing because parents are, they raise us the way they were raised. And at some point, the cycle has to stop. But I was raised also in a very, very conservative, hardcore, you don't do wrong. And if you do wrong, there's major ramifications for that doing wrong. So you turn into the perfect child, the perfect teenager, the perfect so becoming aware, becoming aware of all of those things, but also becoming aware that these thoughts, these same thoughts that haunt me, that put me in a nightmare, they're not real. I simply have to wake up, but I'm aware that they're there and I see them and I feel them and I, oh, there it is again. There it is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's familiar. You're not going to pull me in for two days this time. Surrender is giving up control. Um, and that's the hardest one for most people because I tell people you either can be happy or you can be in control. You can either be happy and let go, surrender, the art of surrender, or you can control your life. And if you decide to control your life, then you will get the outcome. But that's directly connected to the fourth step, which is trusting the journey. I believe my life somehow from starting out in a house without a bathroom to writing six books and being a world class. I, I used to tell rags to riches story about that dragon slayer. Oh, I poor boy did I don't know how in the hell this happened. For me, it's all a big miracle. And if we view our lives as a big miracle, we're in a river. And we're going down that river. And it's a beautiful river. And it's taking us to a beautiful destination. So we're not going to put rocks in our pocket. We're not going to put our feet down. We're not going to get out of the river. There's going to be class five rapids sometimes. And, and my last chapter is embracing the know knowables. We're all dying. We don't know what that looks like. 
So we don't know what's around that corner, but it is trusting that something incredibly beautiful is about to happen. And it keeps happening for me. I was in Mexico all last week designing science and clinical trials and working with students that's going to help potentially millions of people. I was in Darfur when a million people were killed and we were building safe zones. I don't know how any of this happens. But what I do know is it happens because I'm not controlling. I have a perfect willingness and a belief that I'm going to be able to co-create and love the world in a very, very meaningful and beautiful way. And if I believe that, these things come in the journey. So um, when you talk about not controlling things, I think folks might take that as um, like surrendering. So while, while I get the concept of not controlling, you know, not trying to control everything in your life, how does like surrendering and I don't want folks to think they have to just do nothing to achieve happiness because you worked very hard to, to get to where you are today. So how do the two blend being well, a successful it's, person and not like controlling every situation? It's such a good question. And it's probably one of the most asked questions. Surrender, what we're surrendering is our addiction to our emotions. We're surrendering that, but we're not surrendering. We're not sitting in a, you know, a heat hut and, and meditating all day. You know, I meditate 15 minutes in the morning. I walk across campus once a day and have a walking meditation. I do a, a kind of a, a relook at the end of the day. My life has never been more productive, and that's saying something. But it's being more productive without tr without the emotions of trying so hard or insisting on a certain outcome. I'm not insisting on any outcome. I'm simply sitting in my office and I'm working. And again, I've never had a more productive three years. Uh, it, it, so we're much, much more productive. We're getting out of our way. We're not allowing emotions to slow us down. If we give up these unhealthy emotions, one of the things that we find, and it's really, really strange, and I felt it in 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 look at being in two educational institutions in Mexico, people naturally love you. They're naturally attracted to you. They naturally want to work with you. There's something magical that happens when you take your agenda out of the process. So how do folks do that? Like, how do you, um, like, how do you dismantle what you're so programmed to do? The conditioning, the attachments that cause our discontent. Like what, how do folks begin to do that? Well, it takes a, a lot of work. It takes every single day and, and you're sitting. Now I have 13 weeks of meditation in the back of my book and each of these steps, uh, I have meditations for these steps and I'm guiding people through that. But, but as you say, these are attachments, those damned attachments. I mean, these are unhealthy attachments. Mm -hmm. And so we don't give them up easily. We humans evolutionarily, we don't give them up. So it is only in mindfulness. It is only by stilling our minds. It's only by sitting there and watching what's coming in, surveillance of what's coming in. It's only sitting there and going, wow, you know, I keep doing that. I wonder again, where does that come from? What is the, what being aware of, of my tendencies? Why am I doing it? Why do I do it over and over? And then again, letting go. I mean, 
there's a reason that surrender, I think, is in most 12-step programs. And I think there's a reason that surrender should be here because we're surrendering perhaps the biggest, um, the biggest addiction. And that's addi our addiction to our own emotions. And so just like the third step of a 12-step program, surrender sits right at the middle of this, letting go of this, not attaching to these thoughts, allowing them to go because they naturally go away. They get weaker and weaker and weaker. And then we believe that our journey is what it's supposed to be. And we are doing what we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be doing it. We have grand confidence in that. You wouldn't, you can't imagine the peace that will come. Happiness is inside of us. It will emerge if we just take everything else out of the way. So we're emotional beings by nature. Um, some of us are a lot more emotional or display their emotions a lot more readily than others. Where does emotion play into this? Are we supposed to suppress? So say you have an argument with your friend and, you know, you, you want to display whatever emotion you need to. Are you saying at that moment to surrender to that and not give in to that emotional reflex or like, how does it tie in together? No, I, I'm saying not at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting about mindfulness is you are able, it doesn't mean that you don't make hard decisions. You're able to make hard decisions and hard right turns very clearly. But what we would, what I would say is we have to stop reacting. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm emotional too. I'm, I may be the most passionate person I know, but we must stop reacting. We must give it a little bit of time. Maybe we come back to that conversation, but we have to not react because the reaction is coming from the unconscious mind. It's going to slash back. It's going to, and again, not everything about the unconscious mind is bad. Spontaneity is an unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So there's many things that are fun. I, I I used to say it's Homer Simpson, the unconscious mind. Uh, he's a lot of fun. We want Homer. We want some of Homer in us, but we don't want Homer making the decisions when our life is on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I often say if you're a Star Trek fan, Spock is the other side of that. So, so you don't want to have the, not have the emotions of Spock or, and you don't want to have the decision-making of Homer Simpson. And you want these two parts of our minds to be in, in synchrony and you, but to do that, the unconscious mind is so dominant. It's reacting, it's reacting, it's reacting. So the key is turning unhealthy, destructive reactions into healthy responses. Mm. So is that a part of being mindful? So if you're in the middle of an argument, say, instead of reacting to that person, you're saying like to take a beat and, and what? Not react to it? Is that what you're essentially saying? I'm not saying you don't react ultimately, but I'm saying if you need to take three seconds or if you need to take it to the next conversation, make sure that whatever is going to come out of your mouth next is not coming out of that unconscious mind that wants to destroy that person. Now, again, it doesn't mean that you don't leave relationships. It doesn't mean, it means that you perhaps leave them still loving the person, but knowing that that is not possible, that is not best for you or me, that life is short and 
and we need to, you know, we want our lives to, this is the only life we get. Right. It's the only life we get, or at least the only one we know about. So, so we make, we can make definitive choices, but we can make them mindfully. We can make them not in rage. We can make them, we can not burn our own houses down. Mm. Uh, I, I have a, a daughter who's a singer songwriter in Nashville and, and, and I'm all the time just saying, please stop burning your own house down. I mean, it, because you have to put that house back together. Yeah. And so it's much better if you can respond mindfully instead of reacting in a way that that kind of trashes your life and you get to go start over again trying to do something. Yeah. The same all way. Of that does lead to unhappiness. I mean, those are the things that make us the most unhappy. Um, you stated in your book that we need to discover who we are not. And that resonated with me. Um, and that what we should do is like peel away, uh, I guess, the coatings or the layers of our belief system, of society, of conditioning, habits, fears. How do we even begin to, to take on such a monumental task? We watch the news every day. It, it fills us with all this negativity and fear and so what would you say, because you have to watch the news. I mean, you like to be in touch with what's happening. So how do we juggle all? How do we find out who we are not? Well, I, I think for me, it, it's it's come in a lot of stages. I, I have a job. And I've been very successful at that job. But I am not that job. Mm. You know, I am not a world-class scientist. That's not who I, my I is. So you're trying to find out who your I is. I'm not what I do. I'm not even my name. I'm not even my body because my body will, all the cells will replicate themselves over the, you know, most of them over a year, but all of them over six years. So if I were my body, then if I have new cells, I, so I'm not that. I am this spiritual creature i am not my religion and and again i do have a deep faith but one of the biggest things that i've had to do is unlearn all the very nasty parts of that religious faith coming up so i'm not my religion i'm not i so i'm not my thoughts i'm not my political party I'm not any of that. So I'm peeling back all of those things to the essence of who am I or who is I? And who is I is where happiness resides. Once you can do that, I promise you'll be happy because your happiness is contained within your spiritual I. And that spiritual I can do can love the world in unbelievable ways and can impact the world in unbelievable ways. But your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. Your eye is simply you and you're you and it's not all the things that you do and it's not your egoic self. It's so easy to get caught up in your egoic self. I, again, this, this, this week in, in Mexico and it was really important meetings, very high level. And my son gave me the best advice for I before he left. He said, Dad, he said, don't brag. He said, they know who you are. They've read your CV. They've done their homework on you. They know who you are. He said, show them who your eye is. Show them your love. Show them the inside of you. And he said, I promise you're going to make connections that will be earth shaking, but it's not earth shaking because I'm so damn smart. It's not earth shaking because I've done all this. It's earth shaking because my I, my love, my unconditional love is coming through 
me and I'm listening to people. I'm when you're speaking to me, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say next. I'm not thinking about my response. I'm deeply connecting with you. Wow, I really like that a lot. A lot of people don't they don't live that way and they they don't I mean, I I've even noticed more so now in the past few years that when I talk to people they seem so disconnected. They're just I, and I, I can't piece together why, but yet I've noticed that there's this type of awakening that's happening to a, lo a lot of people as well. And it's like a very spiritual uh, type of awakening where people are discovering their own truth. And that's a beautiful thing to witness. But since we're such driven humans, many of us find our self-worth by our careers by our families that we raise, how do you separate that, that ability to discover the I in you and still be driven and successful? Because I think that a lot of that clouds our happiness and causes a lot of unhappiness. And that's why the suicide rates are higher now than ever before, even though these folks are achieving financial wealth and what you know fame on social media and you hear about these stories all the time what's happening there dr ski what's what's going on well as long as we as i said as long as i i can only speak for me as long as i was thinking or wedded to the idea that my happiness would be produced by my accomplishments then no matter what I accomplished, and again, if I, I from that perspective, I may be the most successful person I know. If that wasn't going to produce happiness, and I love what you say, you, you're seeing an awakening. If you're in pain right now, there's three things that can ha happen to you. You can either kind of drown and give in to it. You can give turn yourself into a victim, but be very careful with victimhood because one step, victimhood gives back, oh, poor, poor Carol Ann, she's having such a hard time. And, and we turn ourselves into victim and one step down victimhood and we're dead. The third thing we can do is pain can drive us to a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. So it's like when mothers come up to me and go, oh, my kid's got dyslexia. I go, congratulations. They have unbelievable creativity somewhere and you don't even know about it, but they're going to find it. Well, the same thing about pain. If you're in pain right now, congratulations. It's the only thing that's going to move you to a higher level. And if you use it right, mm -hmm. if it, but if you sink into it, give yourself into it, or turn yourself into a victim, then you're screwed. And it's sad because victimhood is being taught in our colleges as an achievable goal. And it's all over social media. Everybody wants to you know, claim their victimhood. And I, I totally agree. I think it's so destructive. Um, like my husband passed away about two and a half years ago. <clears throat> we were married for 47 years. Um, I found that one of the most difficult things to deal with in, in my life, but I refused to become a victim of that. And I think it's so important that folks, like, let's talk about victimhood. Why do you think it's all over social media? It's a badge of honor. I've I've never witnessed that in all the years I'm on this planet. So what what's accounting for that? Where is that coming from? I don't know. You've asked me the only question so far that I've not had a good answer for. I don't know. I agree. And I think as I watch parents raise kids and I hate to be one of these old timers or go, yeah, yeah, very. but, <laughs> but key to our happiness and key to our survival 
is our ability to gain and push resilience. And resilience is an interesting word because in science right now, in, in almost every scientific institute at NIH, the word resilience is really, really being pushed out there. Health resilience, mental resil resilience, emotional resilience. So the objective is to achieve resilience. The driver of, of uh, the drivers of victimhood are clearly out there. And I, I see it especially, there's a book that I love uh, called The Middle Passage. And I especially see it right now with folks going through the middle passage and, and especially uh, raising raising their kids. I, I think one of the things that uh, I was so blown away by last week, visiting the two uh, education, ed educational institutes in Mexico was the, the, just the brightness, the, the beauty, the laughter, the, there wasn't, these kids are going to a top 20 university in the world uh, top university in Latin America, 60% of them have full scholarships and they're the best and the brightest who have been pulled out of these villages and they've been raised incredibly difficult, incredibly hard. I think just their beauty, their resilience. For me, you know, my strength came out of, 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 the way I was raised. I mean, I, I don't mean to say it, but if our pig died, we didn't eat meat. If our garden was wiped out, we didn't eat vegetables. Uh, there was a powerful resilience built within me. And we have to get back to that because this blaming everyone else and blaming, and it's just... It's part of the tribalism because I tell people there's the opposite of love is not hate. Mm -hmm. The opposite of love is fear. So and every, every bad emotion that we can think of comes out of fear. And when we begin to spend the vast majority of our time fearing others or fearing people not like us, the first thing Homo sapiens did when they came out of Africa was they performed a genocide on Neanderthals. So it's in our DNA, our unconscious DNA, to not like people who are different than us. And we've just, this tribalism, It's there's so much about this period of time I was unfortunate or fortunate enough to be brought up in the deep South during desegregation. And I can honestly say that in my 60 years of life, I've not seen such hatefulness as I see right now since mm -hmm. that time. And that puts it in perspective. We're in a very difficult time and we've got to love. We've got, there's got to be, you know, there's something that we ought to, in many ways, we should have destroyed ourselves completely as a, as a species, you know, a hundred years ago, certainly till now. But there's something that balances there's some love that balances or we would have destroyed ourselves by now. Right. And, and my hope is that that love emerges and, and prevents our self-destruction this time. I, I think politics and, and religion um, creates this gap even more so than than I've ever seen before. I think politics too is the driving force behind a lot of this hatefulness and mind virus that we're suffering right now. But um, how, 
How do you think religion has diverted us from discovering the true I? Has it? Let me ask that question. What's your take on just religion globally? Sure. Well, I find that the heart of most religions is beauty. And whether it's, you know, Buddhism, Islam, whether it's Christianity, whether it's, you know, I, I, I grew up as a Christian. Um, I keep telling people, And, and it, it's kind of funny because Jesus is all of a sudden turning into a walk. His teachings, his teachings, the Good Samaritan, you want to talk about a, a parable about social justice? You uh, the, the rich man and Lazarus, you want to talk about a parable about social justice? Religion is marrying itself to politics. But believe me, it has nothing to do, in this case with Christianity, it has nothing to do with the founder of Christianity, which was Christ. I just walked across this campus, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I just walked across this campus, this two-and-a-half-mile campus, and there were men on every corner trying to give away New Testaments. And I said, I, I, I walked by in each one, I said, who'd you vote for? And I said, I don't want your, I don't want your New Testament. Wow. You're, not, you're not representing the person in that New Testament. And that's not, that's not because that person in that New Testament would be diametrically opposed mm -hmm. to everything that you're standing for. What's the reaction when when you say that? It's it's typically anger. Mm. It's typically you don't know, and, and it's. Funny, um, my my best friend uh, here in Tucson is the pastor of a, uh, a a one of the largest churches, and it's a very accepting, loving. And I'm I'm right now I'm trying to shepherd him through writing a book called The Mindful Christ or The Mindful Jesus, because we've completely missed it. But so is other. I mean, Islam has missed it. I mean, they, they, we, we've become, you know, one person's terrorist is another person's hero. Mm. And so, so, you know, we have completely missed it. Islam missed it. Buddhism gets it a lot more right. But, but they're, these are avatars, usually at the center of these religions, and these religions get bastardized. Do you think that's because of the blending of politics and religion? Like to me, the two just do not belong together. There's no, there's nothing synchronous about mixing politics. And I just think both of them should be very, very separated and, but they're not. And I think that's a large part of the problem. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, they've sold their soul and, and a lot of my friends back in North Carolina who are very conservative, they will, when they read my book, they, they go, I can't believe that you've talked about Buddhism. I can't believe you've. And, and I often say back to them, I can't believe you've associated with this. And when I'm really upset and not so mindful, I will say, I trust my soul mm. and it's ending much more than I trust yours. Wow. Wow. So what else can you tell us about? Ha is, is happiness um, transitory? Like, is it something that 
Because I notice personally, you know, you're happy in the morning and then at night you're not so happy. Like, is that just the ego doing that to us? Because you can't be happy 24 hours a day. It's it's logistically impossible. How do we deal with that, with the ups and downs, highs and lows of happiness? Well, and I, I'll even say it even more. I mean, it's even from generation to generation. We know, for example, that even in the womb, you know, if there's a bad experience going out, you're you're as a child as a inside the womb, you're epigenetically being wired for stress. Wow. So 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 I mean, it can be generation to generation. So many of us are up against a lot more than others, mm -hmm. but we're all up against something <laughs> because there is not many of us who have not had childhood trauma in one form or another. And in many cases in multiple forms. And so these early preverbal childhoods, these early childhoods, these, these even before being born, these previous generations, the the genetics, the thing about gen now I'm going to digress, but the thing about genetics is I remember when we uncovered the human genome, and I remember when uh Bill Clinton goes, okay, we it's done it, 95% of all diseases will be able to be predicted. Well, I think we're at two or three percent. And the reason we're at two to three percent is we didn't realize that there was life taking place on top of life. And that was changing our DNA. And that's called epigenetics. So in real time, if this conversation is meaningful to you, your DNA and your brain is being changed. And it's being changed in ways physically in which you're methylating some DNA and you're changing uh, which genes are expressed and that's happening in real time so and the more it happens the more we lose our ability to choose otherwise so that's why it's such a, a battle for many of us and more for some people than others because we're but we all come with some childhood trauma i come from uh, as I said, uh, some things I mentioned, but also there was a sexual uh, abuse issue uh, by a close friend of the family with me. We all come with this trauma. Right. It's it's there. And that's where we have to become aware, understand the predominance of that unconscious mind and understand that we can rewire that. Um, where does psychotherapy fit into that, dealing with the trauma that we've all experienced in, in childhood? Is it, do you recommend that? Do you do you recommend antidepressants for people that are clinically depressed? Like what's your take on that whole medical area of mental health? Sure. Well, I have a 71 year old therapist. Uh, who beats the crap out of me every week. And um, I'm so grateful for her because when I go into her office, the first time I went into her office, well, before I went into her office, I I, I said, I, if you give me another therapist that says nice work, I said, I swear I'm going to slap them. Uh, I, I said, I said, give me the meanest therapist you got. And she's not mean, she's precious. But the first thing I did when I went into that office is I said, You're, you have one major job. That's to see what I'm missing. So you're to observe me. And there are things that are so close and protected to me that I'm not going to be able to see that I'm screwing up. So your job is to monitor me from the outside and be honest and tell me when I'm not getting it right. And so as for me, that is incredibly 
helpful because it increases awareness. It increases awareness that I somehow am not able to, to garner on my own. So I, I think in terms of antidepressants and things like that, certainly they had their place. I mean, many of us go into holes and the holes are so deep that we're not coming out of those holes. I mean, I took them, took any anxieties for five, six years. We're in deep holes and we need to have help coming out of those holes. Do we need to be on them forever? I can't speak to the individual on that. Mm -hmm. I can only speak for me and I only needed to be on them for five or six years until I began to learn these techniques. Right, right, right. So are you happy now? Like what's your take on your daily level of happiness? Like have you achieved happiness it's interesting you should ask that question. You're you're hard, I Carolyn. I don't know if I want I don't know if I want you back. Uh, now I'm going through relationally a very difficult time right now. I'll just be honest with you. And and uh what I would say is I have been able to relationally make this transition in a different way than I ever have been able to make them before. And I'm able to make it in a way that's not burning down anyone else's house, not hurting anyone else, and not burning my own house down, and, and hurting the least number of people possible, and at the same time doing what I mindfully believe is necessary for the rest of my life. So yes, I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting on the, standing on the edge of this five-story building looking to jump off. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I know this is the right thing. I feel very comfortable with the way that I'm doing it. Um, I'd be feel very comfortable with the sympathy and 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 the love that I'm approaching this issue. So am I happy? Eh, probably ask me in two or three months and I'll be really happy. But am I am I happy with the way that I'm doing this? Absolutely. It's interesting. It just caused me to think about like two very different kinds of happiness. So, and I, I just know personally that there is a global happiness that I can feel, meaning I, I've i learned how to not expect anything, like lowered my expectations just regarding humanity and increasing my gratitude every day. Yeah. So, right, I mean, those That's two things seem to be... <laughs> a good indicator of like maintaining this global level of happiness. So I can feel globally happy, but still kind of sad and depressed some days, but still globally happy. Does that make sense? It completely makes sense. We're going to undulate. The only thing that we can depend on is, is undulation. And C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, talked about the law of undulation and the Buddha talked about impermeance. And the only thing in our life that we can depend on unequivocally is that it will go up and down. It will go up and down. That's the only, and for the Buddhists, that's, that's comforting because when they're up, they know down is coming. And when they're down, they know an up is coming. For C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, you know, he took it a step further and said, it's, only during the downtimes that you're becoming the person that you were meant to be. So, so, but I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Seems to be very true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. So, so this law of undulation seems to be necessary to make us into these beautiful people, but damn, are they painful sometimes? So true. 
So um, in closing, what else can you share with us about um, like what what can your book because I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book and I'm going to reread it because it's it's one of those books and I've had this happen to me before that I've read and I had to reread it because, you know, you're underlining and you're trying to take notes because I just don't want to read something and just have it go into the ether of my consciousness and not make it work for me. So what can folks expect out of your book? Like what, what's the bottom line of expectation after you're reading your book? Carolyn, Carolyn, this is going to sound harsh, but I want this book to wake us up, wake up because most of us are living in a nightmare of our unconscious minds and life is really short again as i've entered my 60s things ain't working the way they used to work life is it's really really short and as i told this these leaders in mexico last week I want to leave a legacy here and I don't want every, anyone to ever know my name was part of that legacy. Mm. I want to leave a legacy of love that's so big, but no one ever knows it was me. And I think we have to wake up. We just, we've got to get out of this social media news cycle look we've in our unconscious in this tribalism at least once a year psychology today will ask me to write a piece on my rural backgrounds in north carolina and what's happening to these people and the word that comes out every time is tribalism tribalism we i can't imagine living my life being that angry every single day knowing that this is the only life you have here my goodness what a waste i think the biggest thing that people don't understand about this life and maybe it took two cancers for me to know is you're gonna die yeah. you're gonna die so this is precious yeah this is precious and and God bless you for your 47 year marriage that that's precious life is precious so wake up wake up speaking of of that I know we're short on time and I, I we went over your hour I apologize um I have so many questions for you we might have to do this again <laughs> um do you what's your in closing, what's your take on NDEs, near-death experiences? Like just a quick summary on what you think about them overall. I find them fascinating. Now, I'd love to know uh, and, and get a little bit more of the science on their validity, but in, in, in which ones are valid. And I wish there was better evidence on that. But I find them fascinating. I find, you know, I find the not wanting to come back, the light, the, mm -hmm. you know, I, I find them fascinating because I don't believe our journey ends here. And I think, uh, but I think what I do think, and I think this is important, if our if our life doesn't, if our journey doesn't end here, we may get a chance to reconnect to the place that we left ourselves mm. and if we whether there's a heaven or a hell i don't even want to talk about that but people who are creating their own hell here uh, if there's something ne next uh, i can't imagine that there's a paradigm shift in their in their next existence. So well said. So well said. Now, how can folks find your book? Um, Amazon, um, of course. Yeah, and I love the Audible version. A good friend of mine from Utah and baritone voice, and 
and it was just it just came out i love the audible version and i just listened to it and i went my goodness i wrote that i was so happy because i wrote it in five weeks on the coast of mexico and i don't even think i wrote it i felt like i was a medium in which it was just coming out of me so fast so uh but uh yes amazon in all forms and if you want to hook up with me uh on instagram it's dot at Dr. Ski Chilton, Facebook, Dr. Ski Chilton. And um, I don't have a lot of fancy smancy stuff because I, I, I just don't have time for a whole lot of social media, but those sites are, are large, larger sites. Great. I'll make sure I share them with folks. Of course, I'll put the links in the description as well as to the links where they can get your, a copy of your book. I highly recommend it. Um, it was very, very eye-opening. And um, like I said, I'm definitely going to reread it again. Dr. Ski, thank you so much for your time. Um, like I said, I still have a lot of questions for you. So maybe we could do this again. In I the would future. love to. Awesome. I would love to. And awesome. Carolyn, you have been an absolute delight. Thank and you've you. been a ch And you've been a challenge. <laughs> so there's been a couple of questions where I'm going, ooh, hadn't been asked that one before. <laughs> But you have been an absolute delight. I hope you have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you. You too. And we'll see you again. I know. I know. Thank Bye. you.